Fab Lab Pour répondre à ces questions, déjà, je vous ramène au niveau du Fab Lab Ketchosan, Dev Kwaknep. Dev Kwaknep qui signifie déjà « Fais-le avec tout le monde ». Alors, le Fab Lab, c'est quoi Le Fab Lab, c'est un espace où tout public peut venir et apporter une partie de son imagination. C'est quoi apporter une, une partie de son imagination C'est qu'ensemble, on essaie de faire quelque chose. Alors, le Fab Lab, c'est un espace où on, appelle, où on accueille le public, on essaie d'accompagner le, le, les idées qui étaient de, 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 de la simple idée au prototypage à travers différentes machines. Le Fab Lab, c'est un espace où on essaie de rendre vraiment les choses simples, on essaie de démystifier tout ce qui est technologie. Donc, ces, ces personnes qui accèdent au niveau de, du Fab Lab, ils comprennent que franchement, la technologie est accessible à tout le monde. C'est seulement le nom qui est nouveau chez nous, mais des Fab Lab, il y a toujours, ça a toujours existé ici au Sénégal. Parce qu'en fait, dans chaque coin des rues, tu vois quelqu'un dans soit son atelier ou bien son garage ou bien qui bidouille, qui bricole, qui fait à peu près du tout. Donc des choses qu'ils n'ont pas appris à l'école. telles que l'imprimante 3D, les buses laser et les CNC. En fait, du CNC, c'est une machine à commande numérique. Il faut juste préciser que toutes ces machines sont des machines à commande numérique. Les différentes machines avec lesquelles nous travaillons, il faut savoir que ces machines ne sont pas accessibles facilement à tout le monde. Donc, quand les personnes arrivent, ils découvrent un nouveau monde. L'imprimante 3D, comment modéliser, ça a déjà, c'est quelque chose que vous avez besoin forcément d'aller à l'école pour apprendre. Mais au niveau d'un Fab Lab, vous apprenez très facilement comment modéliser vous passez d'un simple artisan à un architecte high level, si je peux dire. Donc la question qu'on se pose, c'est de voir comment est-ce que le Fab Lab peut toucher différents domaines. Donc les perspectives du Fab Lab, c'est quoi C'est de voir quels sont les domaines où, en fait, où on peut toucher au maximum. Des ateliers Diri. Un Diri, c'est quoi un Diri Un Diri, c'est un ordinateur, comme on a l'habitude de voir dans la boîte noire, mais cette fois-ci dans un simple bidon. Donc, question de démystifier un peu tout ce qui est technologie. C'est un échange que nous faisons avec les artisans et mes bricoleurs qui sont là. Un échange qu'on fait avec des infographistes et des simples bidouilleurs en leur montrant comment ils peuvent utiliser, selon les machines que nous disposons, comment ils peuvent parvenir à fabriquer des signalités. Tout ça permet aux populations de manière générale de se, de se retrouver facilement parce qu'on parle des signalétiques. Et qui parle des signalétiques parle, n'est-ce pas, d'orientation, de, de, d'information sur le lieu d'arrivée, n'est-ce pas, des populations. Récemment, nous avons fait différents ateliers en, en, en faisant intervenir des artisans du QI, en faisant intervenir des architectes, des, même, même des, 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 des chorégraphes, des danseurs. Nous avons un atelier danse interactif. Donc l'idée, c'est d'assembler de, 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 un peu ce côté artistique, danse avec le numérique. Nous avons récupéré pas mal de matériel qui, sont, qui servent maintenant de déchets que nous avons utilisé en vue de créer les énergies renouvelables et à, à long terme et avec des moyens très accessibles à la population. Le tarif du courant, ça va se, ça va se baisser la facture parce qu'on va chercher à éclairer le jardin à moindre coût. 
avec euh, une éolienne ou un panneau solaire euh, Là, le travail consiste à faire euh, une balançoire avec un système d'énergie cinétique et solaire. Ça consiste à fabriquer euh, une source à énergie éolienne à partir de, des matériaux euh, récupérés ou localement trouvés. Donc on est parti des tutoriels qu'on a trouvés sur Internet et avec quatre équipes qui sont usées pour chaque type d'éléments dont, euh, dont on a besoin pour avoir euh, le, le produit au final, donc l'éolienne. Alors moi je pense que l'éolienne c'est l'énergie du présent parce qu'en fait on en trouve dans les campagnes, en Afrique, enfin, en Europe en tout cas on en trouve dans les campagnes, en Afrique ça commence à arriver dans les campagnes. arriver dans les villes parce qu'on voit que dans les villes africaines on a des problèmes de l'électricité. Donc là vous avez des personnes qui viennent euh, disons sans bagage, je dirais pas bagage intellectuel parce que la simple imagination c'est déjà quelque chose. Donc, ils viennent déjà avec cette imagination et une fois arrivés sur place, ça vient à acquérir de nombreuses compétences. Parce qu'il faut savoir que ne serait-ce que pour commander une machine, il faut déjà savoir utiliser un ordinateur. Donc si on ne doit pas aller vraiment d'acquis, on peut dire voilà, c'est comme une école où on apprend non seulement l'architecture, mais également on apprend à vivre en commun. Cet atelier, franchement, moi, c'était un rêve. Parce qu'en fait, c'était la réalité virtuelle. Donc, euh, c'était pas très, très arrivé ici, ou bien pas très avancé. Donc, moi, c'était la première fois que je tombe ici. Et ça m'a poussé vraiment à faire ce dont j'avais euh, la paresse de faire. Par exemple, l'animation 2D. Je devais en faire, mais à chaque fois, j'avais la paresse. Mais avec ça, je l'ai fait sans même le faire exprès. On a appris beaucoup de choses. Et voilà, on, au premier vue, on ne pensait pas pouvoir faire le faire mais après l'explication des formateurs et tout on, on a pu réaliser quand même quelque chose et c'était excellent nous on a fait euh, la vidéo réalité virtuelle vidéo 360 on a été à gorée et on a essayé d'expliquer l'histoire de gorée à notre manière très souvent euh, euh, on va dans des écoles euh, dans des écoles pour essayer de démystifier un peu toutes ces technologies euh, notamment un projet que nous avions, un projet chez Antadio Fab Academy. Il s'agissait d'aller pour partager les connaissances, essayer de faire euh, des ateliers en électronique, initiation en électronique, à des, à des tout petits, des, des enfants de 8, 9, 10 ans comme ça.
déplaçons très souvent parce que le Fab Lab, ce n'est pas forcément un espace où voilà, on va rester sur place, on dit on attend le public. On essaie de nourrir également la créativité de ces personnes. On se déplace, on va de part et d'autre. Hi everybody, welcome to the Beyond Futures online conference. My name is Denver Hendricks. I am the coordinator of the Fab Lab at the Fada building. Howdy, I'm Trevor. I'm the Fab Lab manager here at Fada. And today we're going to talk to you about what it is we do in the lab, um, what facilities we've got, and the kind of things that we're tinkering with. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So. The idea is to give you a bit of a tour about what we have. So we're sitting in the fabrication lab at the moment, and we have on our right, you won't be able to see it right now, but we'll uh, maybe see some visuals at the end. We have a row of 3D printers on, our, on the one side. We've got some vinyl cutters, vinyl presses, and a VR virtual reality station in the corner. We've got laser cutters in the background there. We have three of them sitting inside the space. And then if we go that way, we've got some CNC machines. And then tucked around the back is a bio lab where we are also tinkering as well. So the idea of the fabrication lab started a few years ago when uh, we moved to the dean that we needed to get involved in the 4 IR realm or else we might just miss the boat. And the idea was that um, we would start by looking at what are those kind of new age practices and what are the machines and methods that are required in terms of our faculty, which is the faculty of art, design and architecture. What do we really require? What type of facility do we need in order to augment and be able to stay abreast of um, the way that we work around art, design and architecture? So we're gonna take you a little bit around the table uh, we just laid out a couple of things that we're busy working on. Uh, but before we go there, I thought we'd just tell you a little bit about the structure of the fabrication lab. So the fabrication lab is not only a workshop. The idea is that we would like to see ourselves as a experimental space, but also as a space for research. So apart from students coming in and doing what we call normal jobbing, uh, that's laser cutting, 3D printing, and CNCing. The idea is that we also drive the culture of fabrication uh, through the different hardware software, but it's backed up by research, which is what we're doing and which we will produce. And the idea is that it stimulates and catalyzes the culture, but also becomes um, a proactive, um, innovative space in terms of research, not only in the faculty, not only in the university, but in South Africa. And um, also, being inside the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture, we have an open garage door policy, and that means that anyone can come through the space, and it leads to interdisciplinary activities, collaborative um, activities. So we have interior design, industrial design, visual arts, um, fashion, jewelry, architecture, they were all moving through the space. And what we we're doing is collecting information from those departments in terms of skills used, materials used, ideas or methodologies in terms of fabrication. And we draw that into the space and almost become a nexus point for, for disseminating that information to anybody who needs to go down a particular roadway um, in terms of their design. So we're going to start with some of the basic um, machines that we normally use. And this is around the additive 
family group. Um, these are what for 3D printing um, products. The little machine that you see on your right hand side over there is a smaller version of the 3D printer. And we've got a few bigger ones. And we're also expecting a, another resin printer, which is coming along. Now, the 3D printer kind of world is vast. There's developments around 3D printing ceramics, 3D printing food, 3D printing concrete. And it's also scalar. So we're printing and rapid prototyping small items like this. And the advantage, of course, as some of you might know, is to rapid prototype five, 10 of these at the same time. But then also you get larger scalar things, as I mentioned, around different materials. We can build a 3D printer the size of this room uh, using different materials. This type of approach or, the, or the, the, the venturing into this type of world is quite exciting, uh, can be a bit complex, but uh, we definitely in ourselves, this lab, are trying to head towards building our own uh, 3D printers as well. So when, we, when we're working with the 3D printers, it's not just straightforward jobbing with the students or the lecturers. Um, us in the lab, we're actually tinkering with the machines, um, uh, coding mechanism, the G-code, and what we're doing is manipulating the machine and actually pushing the, the, the finite boundaries that it's originally given you. So for example, we have over here, this was a sample printed for um, the fashion department as inspiration. So a multi-directional, multi-axis uh, material that's been 3D printed, but it's actually bound to the material. And the way we did that was um, we just manipulated the G-code of our 3D printers there, and we told it to stop and pause and sort of get out of our way so that we could place the um, material down and then continue the print after that. So this just opens up the doors in terms of how can I fabricate and what are the limitations. And once you know the limitations of these machines, then you can start doing workarounds and that feeds directly back into your design approach as well. So I know what they can do and this is how I'm going to approach my design um, from this method. We've also got, um, these are downloadable files, but we use them as samples for now. But what it does, it creates um, what eventually hardens as a plastic. You can uh, fabricate um, a three-dimensional piece of plastic that is loose and can be able to um, act as a piece of material. And this becomes very exciting for multi-disciplines uh, in the faculty. So with, with these kinds of experimentations that we're doing and holding this type of knowledge, it actually opens up a lot more doors uh, for us, but for everybody else as well. So um, just in terms of ideas, this could be probably, uh, you could go down the roadway of smart uh, fashion or smart wear, replacing the 3D printed little module parts here with sensors, and then analyzing that data, and then reforming new designs and new methods or new, new ways of thinking about design when you're doing something. So the next uh, uh, kind of uh, workshop um, machines that we're going to start looking at now is the work around the CNC router. And um, in my hand over here, we've got a CNC routed uh, piece of resin. And over there on, in, on his left hand side, he's also got a piece. It might be too far to see, but the CNC router works in terms of subtractive manufacturing. And we, what we're experimenting with here is we're experimenting with polymers and resins. And the idea is that we start to cast things and then also CNC route to them. And the idea is that we can begin to play with different materials and experiment with materials like PVC, which is essentially the pipes that you use in your, in your homes for waste pipes. But also we can start casting silicone uh, molds for these things. So this, this, this adds into the whole idea of rapid prototyping. Um, with your 3D prints, you would move into the space then of molding. If you're happy with your 3D prints, um, then you would start looking at more cost-effective ways and also time management ways to reproduce um, the products that you've got. Um, like Denver said, with the CNC machine, you probably can't see it, but the CNC has enough finesse to capture about 50,000 facets on you. So 
this has had no finishing on it. It comes off the machine ready like this. It's just done. The next uh, machine we want to do uh, introduce you to is the laser cutting machine. It's also subtractive manufacturing, and the machine is sitting right at the back there. Those are two large workhorses. Um, it works with a, um, a laser, and it it works with different kind of speeds and different power. So what we were busy experimenting with is a library of finishes, especially in terms of teaching and learning. What we're trying to uh, figure out is what can we cut and at what speeds and at what strength, and also what can we be able to cut that can begin to mani manipulate. This is essentially MDF, it's a three millimeter MDF, and these are patterns that can be easily downloadable or you could design your own. But what's interesting about this is uh, MDF is usually an architectural or interior design product. But when you start to cut into it, you can start to uh, apply it to other industries like fashion, for example, or jewelry design. So with our little samples, um, we're going around and obviously asking the departments what materials they use, how they use them, what sort of information comes attached to that. So almost like a spec sheet for materials. And then our hope is in the future to have something tactile like this in a, in, in a sort of periodic table way. So you have something like this where a student or a lecturer could pick it up and actually feel the material. And on the back side, there would be a QR code where you could scan and it would take you to the digital repository with all that additional sort of information like speeds and speeds, what machine, um, how long, what applications there are. Um, you could also add additional sort of resources to this information like check out this video or have a look what this person did or see where the boundaries are being pushed. So yeah, that's uh, our laser cutters. Um, a lot of laser cutting is done as well. If I just scooch over a little bit, you can see this is one of the students' works. This is a topographical map, a contour map. Um, so they design it. We help them with the, the, the software element. So we get the, design, the files and they're all nice and clean so that we can cut them out. And then obviously the students then develop their concepts from this model as a reference point. So the next item, we've covered most of the machines now. It was the 3D printer, the CNC router, and the laser cutter. Laser cutter yeah. And then we started talking about the interfaces with uh, polymers, resins, which helps to assist those things. Um, before we move on to res the research project that we're working on, um, I want to introduce you to uh, some of the things that we're also tinkering with, which has become more and more popular today uh, around design. And these are what we call the Arduino boards. These are starter kits, which we are busy working with. And uh, these are sort of PC boards, which are programmable. And what is really interesting about this is that um, we can now start to download codes in order to make almost anything move. Now, the application is vast. And the idea is that we can use it in architecture. So if you want something to move in an architectural space, based on sensors, light, temperature, or the little camera. These are the little PC boards, and it's got all the other sensors in this box. And we um, have an architecture interior as well, as well as fashion. So if we go back to some of these uh, materials that we are busy printing, if you start combining these with structural elements inside of a garment of some sort, we can start allowing these things to move with these little microchips these can actually be attached to the garment and you can actually allow those items to be to move. So what's great about this stuff as well is the, the Arduinos and even the Raspberry Pi, which we have as well. And um, those are like introduction into coding. And I, I believe that as a student, you should be able to pick up this coding because it's starting to uh, be uh, starting to be pushed into software. So when you're working and you're designing, you have the options of um, coding your elements out. And these visual coding mechanisms that work on this on these types of systems, they are really nice, clean, non-intimidating way to introduce students to the actual coding itself. And like Ember said, it's pretty much 
find the code online, click copy paste, and then modify according to your necessities. So yeah, these are great little things. All right, the next thing we want to move on to is the VR headset over here. And uh, we've got two of these headsets. We've also got um, uh, a third one as well. And these are quite, uh, most people will be familiar with them. But what is interesting about them is that uh, quite a few of the disciplines in terms of design, we can use them to design in virtual reality 360 degrees immersively. And the beauty about this is that there's no constraint. So the idea is that when you move your arm around, you can literally move around the work that, you, that you're making and you can export that work into a uh, 3D printer. Uh, you can also export it into a digital model as well. Um, so we've just been finishing up with a student and they created um, a virtual reality collage for their works. And then we moved that out of the virtual headset into a video format and that video format then can be showed to the lecturers for cutting. Um, we also managed to get that um, a, that a virtual collage into uh, Rhino and then manipulate it in Rhino as meshes and a 3D object, which is really cool, has some really cool applications there, which means a lot of the software is now beginning to talk to the other kinds of software. It's exciting. So moving into some of the research that we are, are working on, one of the research projects we're looking at is to use VR in terms of how we experience history, how we experience time. And I can't say too much about the project, but the idea is that you want to immerse yourself into, into a, another period. This is a great tool to do that. Um, it takes quite a bit of coding, quite a bit of development to put yourself in that environment, but this is going to be a very exciting project for us to work on. Then um, another project that we're working on in terms of research is the uh, mycelium. Mycelium is essentially um, the root or the, the basis of which uh, mushrooms uh, are, are, are grown from, mushroom being the fruit. And um, this, this research project is specifically is significant because what we're trying to uh, develop here, and, th and although this is not internationally, this is not new to grow mycelium, but the idea is that the application that we want to um, look at for our local context is if this material is fireproof, fire resistant, if it is waterproof, then could we use it for a building material? Could we use it for insulation? And can we use it for building blocks? Can we use it for interior cladding? Can it be used for fire resistance? Um, so with the biomaterials, um, mycelium is our start point, and we'll probably move into other sort of bioorganisms and working with them. Um, but here is a great start point. Like Tembi said, this is not new, te new technology or new research, but contextually, this is super important for us. Um, these are, the substrate is just waste product and the mycelium consumes it. And we actually get a brick, something like this grows in about five to seven days, 10 days. Um, so you, your brick is growing itself, which is phenomenal. Um, we also uh, would look at different kinds of strains of mycelium and then adapt them to the substrates. And those would produce other types of qualities in terms of material. You might get something that's rubbery or something that's soft and light or something that is quite hard. Um, so that's the point of the research to develop. And that will all happen inside our little bio lab, um, which is also really exciting. And we have a, 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 a collaborative partnership there with Viad, um, Leora Faber. She's going to be doing her bio art inside that space. So we'll be growing cultures in the petri dishes, lots of sciencing stuff. And then once we're happy with where we're at, we will develop that into um, a scaled production to see um, any inconsistencies that happen and how it actually works out for us. And then just before we uh, finish off, one of the little machines that you see in front of you there might not also be new, but that's a little drone that we've got there. And that is also for the use of uh, mapping, uh, photogrammetry, um, and also just for documentation. 
Of course, we need a license to fly that. So we uh, use licensed pilots to fly that, that drone, but it helps us to uh, access a lot more fine data uh, that, we, that we require that what satellites cannot give us. So we're also using the drone for our design applications as well. So I think we've come to the end of the show and tell. I thought we could just wrap up by saying a little bit what the Fab Lab means to us, what it means to the faculty. Um, I think that um, we've now been formally established here, apart from starting a few years ago, we've been in the space and set up running since uh, February. And uh, Trevor, what do you think the lab means to you? Okay, so, so to me, this is an exciting space because we're opening up the doors. We have um, opening up the doors and almost breaking down silos within um, the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture by um, getting everybody to collaborate and really consume the idea of 4LR as an augmented portion of the curriculum. Um, also, we have a Fab Lab Young Makers program. So we have individuals from each department who uh, move through the space and they learn to work on the machines and they interface with each other. And then hopefully we have an exhibition towards the end of the year where they showcase some of the work and some of the experience that they've gained in terms of knowledge on the machines. Um, for me personally, it's really exciting because this space we are on the front line in terms of um, technology here. Um, we can start developing solutions and innovative solutions to our contextual issues um, and really sort of gaining confidence as South Africans uh, when it comes to these are my ideas, this is my identity, this is my design, and it has value and meaning. Yes, I think that um, the, the University of Johannesburg uh, thrust in uh, for our R is, is an umbrella. And I think it's important for us in the different faculties and departments to kind of tease that out of what it means uh, for us. And uh, what we've done uh, so far successfully is to uh, create a very strategic position, both as a physical space, but also as a cultural space that has an application for teaching and learning in terms of uh, research, in terms of collaboration, and I think it's, it's, it's very exciting to, to be able to um, work in a, in a focused way, but then also to develop our, our own research, as Trevor mentioned. I think what's really exciting is that the students are really excited about the space. When they see what, the, what we have in the lab and what we have access to, uh, their eyes light up. And um, I think it's, it's really nice to be a student these days, barring obviously Corona and the pandemic, but I think uh, it, it taught, we are charting a new path for us and we, are, we have to be conscientious in the way that we, we move forward. In terms of technology, we also have to be mindful of how we use technology to better our societies and our environment. Um, and I think that we have to also keep in mind that we are trying to solve our own local problems and we're trying to improve our society um, and our and we're trying to improve and develop our academic kind of um, um, infrastructure in a sense. So I would like to say thank you very much for this opportunity, Trevor. Yes, thanks so much. Um, I'll be glad to be joining you all online and having a look and listening to everybody else chatting about um, uh, the future um, in Africa and beyond. And yeah, it's gonna be an epic journey. Thank you, Mulemo um, and Andani Africa for setting this up. We really appreciate uh, being invited into the space and showing our lab off. And thank you very much. Bye from us. Ciao. Ciao.